Okay, thank you very much. My name is David Friedman. I work for a company called Clarinet. I have two presentations, um, and I'm going to start with the first of which, which is actually why, and to respond to the last presentation as well, you know, you, you talk about there not being providers that can do IPv6 DOS mitigation. It's surprisingly hard, and I'm about to show you why. So this talk is about using routing to steer or block traffic, but it is not about what you do with it afterwards. So I'm not going to talk about how we scrub the traffic and make it clean because that's pretty rudimentary and not as interesting. This is just about how we get the traffic to the places that it needs to go in order to be either discarded or scrubbed. And actually I should say that we do a combination of things depending on the type of customer that we're dealing with. So for example, in a lot of cases we'll discard traffic that's the destination of an attack. Why do we do that? Depends on the type of customer. Some customers are um, on platforms that are what we call volume hosting. So for example, they may have a website or they might have um, uh, some, some mail routing, they may have an address that's associated with them and it's residential traffic and it's not something that they would either care about um, uh, being, you know, or, or be willing to pay for a mitigation service for, or not something they even realise or would even be affected by. And the problem is that when you get lots of traffic destined towards that address, um, it can take out the rest of the network associated with those platforms and it causes a lot of collateral damage. So in those cases we'll discard. I'm going to talk about the cases where we discard um, just because it's simpler to represent in terms of some of the problems that I'm going to be explaining. So generally, um, when we're discarding this traffic, we'll announce a host route into the network, a slash 128 for IPv6. Um, and this applies, of course, to the destination, but as I'm sure some of you know, it could also apply to the source. So there are cases where if we inject the source of an attack into the network and there's a single or a few known sources, we could drop those at the edge of the network with loose unicast reverse path forwarding, as in we could make the, the next hop to the source invalid and then discard the, the traffic source from those addresses as being ineligible due to that. Um, but mainly we in, will inject a destination. Um, in order to do that we need a next hop. Um, and for many years, and we've had V6 on the network for many, many years now, um, that next hop used to be something along the lines of our slash 32 prefix in the UK, 2001, 88, colon, colon, dead. Because it was dead. Um, and then uh, RFC uh, quadruple six came out um, and this mandated that a slash 64 prefix was uh, to be allocated for the use of uh, such manipulation uh, and, we, and this prefix is 100 colon colon slash 64 uh, and we actually moved to 100 colon colon dead but it was still dead right? so people had to know the traffic was going to the bit bucket um, and traffic being selectively filtered i.e. to be scrubbed it has of course a real next hop and the real next hop is that of the filtering platform. So pretty straightforward so far. So how does this actually work in practice? So in practice there's a controller um, and the controller analyzes flow data and gets telemetry from around the network um, and it analyzes this and it works out very quickly whether there's a denial of service attack in progress um, and then it makes some quick decisions and it makes a decision whether it's based on the customer type, whether it's going to block or whether it's going to send it to a filtering platform. The controller has to be able to signal this to the rest of the network. Um, and it does this using BGP, you know, standard protocol um, for uh, being able to suddenly, if we needed to in inject a, a large volume of routes into the network, you know, there'd be no other way of doing that um, without doing some kind of um, you know, you know, custom or proprietary programming of the routers. BGP is the most standard way of doing this, but um, we need full visit, but we need bi-directional BGP because not only do we need to be able to inject prefixes into the network, but we need visibility in order to enrich the telemetry as to where the traffic is coming from and where the traffic could possibly go to. So we need full visibility of paths. We need a full BGP feedback. And when we inject, we also need to be able to inject attributes that if you had standard eBGP, we wouldn't have access to, like for example, the local preference. And this is for many reasons, but one of which being the legacy where we have islands of, you know, confederations and all sorts of nastiness um, in the legacy of us operating a network for almost 20 odd years. Um, and we also, and, and here's the problem, we can't overwrite the next top. And I'll talk about this in the next slide. So the 
controller lives out of band. It's, it's a little place not on the network. And all of its supporting infrastructure is also in this little place. Um, and this out of band network is directly attached to the network via dedicated circuits. So every place, um, in fact, around our global footprint where we've got our own network, we attach this out of band network to it. Um, and we've got dedicated circuits to do it. I mean, the, the network's used for other things, but mainly for this sort of telemetry um, and mitigation. Um, and it's attached to a number, but not all routers, because obviously, you know, there, there has to be some density sort of scale calculation in there. Um, and the out-of-band network has its own dedicated routing domain. So the interconnects between the out-of-band network and the real network, there's eBGP on those, um, but we overlay on top of that um, our IBGP uh, mesh to the ISP routers to do this traffic steering. So already you know, there's a bit of complexity here. So let me take a detour and start uh, uh, telling you why this is so much of a problem. So our network had native v6 since about 2001. Um, and we decided to deploy MPLS in 2003. And why did we do that? Uh, we didn't do that to be able to remove the routing table from the core routers. We did that to be able to sell L3 VPN because everybody else was starting to do that in 2003 and that was the popular thing to do. Um, uh, and when we deployed MPLS in 2003, um, we signaled label reachability. We signaled reachability and, and, and the labels associated with the transport via the label distribution protocol. Um, but of course there was no IPv6 support for that, so we had to route IPv6 on top. So we had this label switched v4 network, but then we had the, a, a, a naturally routed v6 network on top of this. And really, you know, the only solution if we wanted to do MPLS was, was 6PE. And, and I stubbornly held out for, for v6 over LDP. I said, you know, it, it, it will come, it has to be the same, you know, it will, it's just, just please, you know, don't do anything, don't deploy 6PE. Um, and then I was interviewed by the RIPNCC in 2009, and they said, you know, what do you regret? And I had to say, well, uh, if I could go back in time, I, should, I probably would have done 6P earlier, because there's a real pain in the backside to do now. Um, and actually, I really, I dragged my feet over it for many more years, and eventually, in 2013, um, we deployed 6P. Uh, I just gave up by that point. Um, and actually getting 6 VP, so L3 VPNs doing V6 is just an added bonus from that. Uh, not that we had much of a requirement for it. Um, but the problem is, of course, this DOS mitigation platform doesn't natively support 6P because 6P is a, something in the routing domain. It's not something that you'll find people developing software for or vendors doing integration with. Um, but we thought, you know, the attachment to the core network doesn't really require it. So the plan was that we would use the, the attachment, we would use IBGP, what we call AFI2, SAFI1, so IPv6 Unicast, some of you know that as, that's the non-labeled V6, we'd use that as the attachment, um, but then internally inside the, inside the ISP core, we would use 2.4, so that's the 6P uh, SAFI uh, to do that. And, and actually, this is where it all started going wrong. Um, so the scene is set, uh, so the outbound network is attached to the core, as you see there in the cloud at the top. Uh, the out-of-band network infrastructure is signaled via eBGP 2.1, so that's our normal IPv6 unicast interconnect with the core. Um, the controller has these um, congruent BGP, IBGP 2.1 sessions, so that the, the IBGP sessions follow the circuits, they go over the circuits where the out-of-band are into the core routers. Um, the routers have to treat the out-of-band network as a route reflector client, because of course we won't pass on routes in IBGP from someone who's not a route reflector client, that's the nature of IBGP. Um, and the controller signals the pre prefixes for discard by setting the next hops to 100 colon colon dead via IBGP. And of course we can do that because it's IBGP. And the routers then send, supposedly send their prefixes back to the root reflector um, as IBGP 2.4. That's, that's how we hoped it would work. Um, but it didn't work, in fact. Um, it didn't work because the prefix at the edge between the core and the out-of-band network, um, when it was sent to the RR, that was fine. But when the RR then tried to send it onward to our RR clients, they didn't accept it. Um, the problem with that was really the fact that the uh, way we implemented the discard was that we'd put a next, we'd put a slash 128 static route for 100 colon colon dead into the main global routing table for V6, so the, which ended up being the equivalent of the 2-1 lock rib in BGP terms, the local routing table that BGP knows about. Um, but of course the prefix K 
came over a 2.4 session, it came over a 6P session. Um, so the core routers are running ISXR, the root reflector's running a modern version of iOS, and, and Cisco's ISXR doesn't like this, in fact it gets very unhappy about this. Um, and try as they might, Cisco couldn't actually make it like this. Um, so that was a problem. And the controller couldn't speak EBGP, nor could it speak IBGP 2.4. Um, so the only way around this was really to change the next hop, to make the next hop something inside 2.4. Um, but how do you do that? Because if you don't speak labels, you can't use labels. There's no, nothing really inside 2.4 that you can use as a next hop. And, and we couldn't, there was no technology that existed to specify a 2.4 next hop manually. So all we could really do was, do, was set um, the next hop on the edge to ourselves. Um, and that meant you know, that traffic would have to be dragged across the core and then, and then terminated at the out-of-band interconnect point and then discarded. It was very suboptimal. Um, and it was very messy as well, because it was the only way we could get it working and up and running. Um, so we, had, we configured a root policy. We, we put some policy on the OOB interconnect core and we said, you know, set the next hop to self. But it didn't work. Um, because, of course, you can't rewrite next hops in IBGP, you see, unless you're the originating router, which we're not. Um, so Cisco sat and thought about this for a while and said, I know, um, it, it's clear that you've got a real use case here. We'll build a special knob into RSXR that lets you do this. And they raised the uh, uh, DDTS and, and they gave us this special command, IBGP policy out enforce modifications. Um, but it's global to the router and we thought that was a bit weird, so, so we did this. Um, and, um, and then we thought, ah, oh, okay, so, but this is, this is about manipulating the next hop in its own IBGP. So actually we realized we had to configure the next hop self to rule the reflector. Um, but we added it and it, it you know, it enabled next hop self to work. Um, but it also rewrote the next hop for every other configured client as well, um, as in it modified everything. Um, at that point we said, oh yeah, that's why it's a, that's why it's a global command, right? So we need some kind of selective rewrite. Um, we really uh, uh, were forced into a corner here. We had to selectively rewrite the next hop. Um, so write a policy that, to say, well, if the next hop was, was uh, if it was supposed to be discard or filter, then rewrite the next hop itself, you know? So you could, you could do some introspection on it, and that was the best we were sort of gonna get. When we had to put that policy again on the session toward the reflector, and it was ugly, and, and by this point getting uglier. And we applied it, it did seem to work. Um, but then one day it broke mysteriously when one of the infrastructure links failed. So we discovered it was fault intolerant. Um, one day one of the infrastructure links failed between the out-of-band network and the core and the EBGP session that had been running on top of this, uh, that had been running on the link went down and the IBGP session that had been running over the link that was now running over the other link but going back to the core router where the first link went was also down. And we thought, why is that? Because, you know, the IBGP uses the infrastructure as a transport network. Um, and when we debugged it, we saw that the IBGP TCP segments, so the BGP control messages, were being delivered via the out-of-band infrastructure to the other core router, destined to the original core router where the IBGP session had been built, and it was discarding them. The core router was discarding the TCP segments. Actually, we found out later that it was discarding its replies, not, not, the, not, not the requests we were sending it. But the session was torn down and we were dead in the water. Uh, yep, RSXR again, it's not possible to peer over an unnumbered V6 6PE interface. It is not possible. And Cisco said, yep, sorry about that. Um, and even worse than that, at the time, the TCP, receiving a TCP SYN caused the buffer leak, uh, and then we eventually had to restart the con part of the control process. Um, the workaround we were given is, well, you know, you have to, sorry, you have to renumber, the, you have to put some numbering on the core interface. Um, but we can't do that um, because when, when we did the 6P implementation, uh, we, we had to migrate from dual topology uh, ISIS to single topology because the way that we did the, the rooted V6 versus the label switch V4 is we had them in two separate ISIS topologies so that um, changes in one didn't affect the other. So uh, we had this single topology, but if we added V6 numbering to this link, it would be putting a new address family into this single topology it wasn't designed for, so that would have horribly broken things. So, 
um, yeah, we were stuck again. So what options did we have? We needed to get these TCP segments to the core. Um, delivery couldn't be labelled, of course. Yeah, we couldn't peer over our numbered interfaces. Um, if we wanted to route it, we'd have to put V6, natural V6, back onto the core point to point. So we'd have to put V6 back onto every core interface again, like we had before 2013. And then we'd have to put the V6 address family back into single topology ISIS, or we'd have to re-add the second topology. Um, and then we'd have to add all these IBGP2-1 sessions between all the core and the root reflectors. And then we'd have to add BGP, IBGP2-1 to the root reflectors as well. So it was, it was quickly becoming a mess. And at this point, we, were the, well, we, we need to think about backing out of 6PE. But we didn't, we stuck with it. Um, so we had to find a sticking plaster fast because you know we need to provide a mitigation service. Um, and we couldn't use MPLS because of course the TCP can't be labeled. Um, so we, we pulled out um, uh, you know, our old friend GRE and we deployed a unidirectional GRE tunnel from the out of band infrastructure to the core handoff points. And this meant the TCP arrived inside IP and, and the Cisco didn't see this and everything was okay and, and, and everything worked. And that was okay for a while. Uh, and then we, then we, so we hobbled along using these tunnels for some time. And, and one day we upgraded RSXR, uh, and the upgrade broke the GRE forwarding. Um, and it turns out that because we deployed FRR in the network, well, at this point, we'd, we'd uh, yeah, I know, um, we, we deployed IPFRR, um, GRE over FRR is not officially supported. In fact, actually, GRE over MPLS wasn't officially supported either until the version we upgraded to. And it turns out that adding GRE over MPLS support broke our working GRE over MPLS over our FRR support. <laughs> so just as we were about to give up, we noticed that we noticed <laughs> that the BGP issue had actually been partially fixed. Although the active transport didn't work anymore, in this new version, the passive transport did. We, we caught a session coming up out of the corner of our eye and we didn't understand how and it turns out that it just so happened that it wasn't the initiator, the other party was and it had passively accepted and established the session and, and it turns out that in introducing this support they also fixed the passive BGP transport. So if the controller initiated the session, i.e. its transport was active and the, and the core router's transport was passive, we could respond and we could establish it. So we could rip out the GRE and, and move back to native transport. So was it all worth it? Not really. 6P and IBGP was a poor choice. It wasted months of our time and it annoyed the hell out of everybody. Um, in the short term, we're probably going to move to EBGP because the controller can actually do that. But in the long term, I think that's, we've had it with 6PE. <laughs> Um, and we're probably, we're looking at moving to segment routing for V6, we're looking at it. Um, 6P is really, really painful to troubleshoot. Um, and, and this is, uh, you know, one of the things I said about 6P at the time is, oh, it can't be that bad. It's been in the, been in the industry for a while, it must be mature. So, uh, and, and we want to reuse the label core. So yeah, probably segment routing for us. <laughs>